Thank you, Dr. Flaherty. We're gonna save the questions for the panel. I know there's a lot of questions that'll, that we have for Dr. Flaherty. And you're a poet, biological asymptote. It's just so poetic. Uh, so next up is, um, is Dr. Khadija Ferryman, who is a postdoctoral scholar at the Data and uh, Society Research Institute in New York. Um, we've asked uh, Dr. Ferryman to talk about some of the um, inadequacies of data and the challenges around data to set that forward for the rest of the workshop. Dr. Ferryman, please come forward. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for uh, inviting me here. I'm, this is my first time here presenting, so I'm really excited to uh, talk with you this morning and share uh, some of my research um, and ideas on risk of bias and inequities in precision uh, medicine. So first, let me just start and say that um, I work at the Data and Society Research Institute, which is a nonprofit independent uh, research institute in New York City. Uh, we aim to essentially understand the social and cultural impacts of data-centric technology. Um, and it's a group of social scientists who are also interested in technology. And we really try at Data and Society to sort of fill this gap between understanding technological optimism and sort of where uh, these technologies uh, meet human, human factors uh, and human social and cultural factors. Uh, so that's a little bit about the Institute. Uh, so I have a pretty brief list, list of disclosures. I'm also, I should say, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist, and so I actually previously haven't done a disclosure slide like this before. This isn't kind of standard in my field, but here they are. Um, so first I want to start with this question of what is precision medicine. Now, we are all here at a precision oncology workshop, so this it sort of goes without saying that we all understand what precision medicine is. But in the research that I've done with some leaders in precision medicine, there actually are a number of different definitions of precision medicine. And so I want us to sort of uh, go through uh, some going into a little bit more detail on what we actually mean by precision medicine, uh, because I think it's really important to sort of break, break out this term to really understand the risks for bias uh, and uh, the risk for bias and uh, discrimination if we have a, a sort of shared sense of what we really mean by this term. So I'll start with um, our former president and, and how he defined precision medicine back in 2015. So here in this definition, he defines it as an, a, an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. And what's important about this definition, I think, is that it points to both the methods and the kinds of data. So precision medicine is about individualizing. So if we think about the kinds of methodologies that are gonna be brought to bear, but also, what I think is important to highlight is the difference in the kinds of, of data that will be marshaled for precision medicine, right? So not just genetics, environmental data, lifestyle data, and we can also talk about what exactly, and, and some of the presenters have already talked about that, what these different data sets might look like and what they can bring and what their limitations and, and challenges are. Um, and I wanna further sort of break down this definition of the precision medicine approach into these three categories, risk prediction, diagnosis, diagnosis or detection, and treatment. And again, this morning we've heard a presentation sort of on all, th on all three of these categories. But again, I think it's important to kind of keep these distinctions in mind as we think about the potential for bias and discrimination. And again, these look very similar to how we think about approaches in medicine, but as we start to go through the risks for uh, bias and discrimination, I want us to keep these different categories in mind, and I'll go through uh, some, some case examples along these uh, three categories. So the first I'll start with is an example um, of bias in risk prediction. And this is an example that may be familiar to some of you. Um, so this is a case where um, a group of black patients in a hospital system in Boston were tested for a genetic variant um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and were told that they had, uh, that they had the, a variant, uh, the pathogenic variant. And then when they were sort of 
tested, uh, brought him in for additional testing. Um, it was confirmed that these variants were actually not pathogenic, right? But they did sort of go down this pathway of um, being tested, talking with various clinicians and family members. And so this is an article that some of you may be familiar with that sort of brought this issue to light. And so the previous slide, I should say, is from a kind of popular press um, coverage of this case. And this is the the academic article that kind of brought this to light. And one of the main takeaways from this article is that um, what, the, what the authors point out is that simulation showed that the inclusion of even small numbers of black Americans in control cohorts probably would have prevented these misclassifications. And so this is something for you know, those of you who are familiar with genetic data, right? There, um, the uh, lack of sort of inclusive populations impacts um, how these variants are, are uh, classified. But what I think is important about this article is that it, it brings it from out of the realm of just okay, these variants can be misclassified to what actually happens to people in the clinic in the real world when these misclassifications happen, right? So this is, a, this is an example of precision medicine, something happening sort of right now where we're already seeing um, some limitations in risk prediction. So the next case I want to bring up is uh, along in, uh, in the category of diagnosis and detection. So this is, again, another uh, kind of popular press article, and it uh, describes sort of the potential for artificial intelligence-driven dermatology to uh, essentially not be as accurate for people with darker skin. Um, and part of the reason for this is, again, the data that's used to train, uh, train the algorithms, train the AIs. And there's a particular uh, database, I have it in my notes, but there's a particular database that's quite popular of, uh, or that's used to power this particular um, AI that's used in this article um, that is, has uh, digital images of skin lesions from uh, the US, Australia, and I believe the UK. And the majority of the images are from people with lighter skin. And so um, when we think about an example like this, we could say, well, you know, it kind of makes sense that um, the, the data would look like this. Um, in the US, for example, um, melanoma, um, there's a higher incidence rate of melanoma in, in white Americans. So of course, the data would be sort of more representative of them. However, on the other side of that, um, even though the incidence rate is lower in black Americans, the survival rate is much lower. And I feel, and um, what that points to is sort of a, a, a where there is challenges in sort of diagnosing, right? Diagnosing uh, skin cancer in that particular population. And so if we think about these clinical challenges and then how the data is, is sort of pulled into these technologies, we can quickly see how uh, there can be ripple effects here. Uh, and again, this, this point that I'm, I'm making with the previous example and this example, they point to this larger um, and more longstanding issue of diversity in clinical research. So although the, although the technologies are new, we can think about genetic risk prediction as fairly new. We can certainly think about AI-driven uh, uh, skin cancer detection as new. But the sort of underlying issue of diversity is one that's, that's not new. So this is from an article published uh, a few years ago um, that assesses the sort of the issue of diversity in clinical research across the board. But in this article in particular, uh, they highlight uh, cancer research and, sa and say that sort of here, here's the quote, since the passage of the Revitalization Act in 1993, and for if you don't know, this was an act that aimed to increase the diversity of clinical trials. Um, as they state, less than 2% of more than 10,000 cancer clinical trials funded by the National Cancer Institute included enough minority participants to meet the NIH's own criteria and goals. So again, I want us to just sort of sit with that, sit with this for a moment, right? Less than 2% of the, the trials um, feature enough minority participants to meet the, these criteria and goals. And we can think about them, again, in relation to these precision medicine, these precision oncology tools that will be developed, and thinking about um, how data that includes sort of less than um, less than two, or the the majority of of these data that are not inclusive, how will that then affect these tools that are being developed for precision medicine, for precision oncology, kind of down the line. <clears throat> 
And so the, the final example is that, that I want to bring up is in this case of treatment. And so again, this may be one that is um, familiar to some of you. So this is the case of uh, the blood thinner Plavix. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the trial that uh, established the clinical guidelines for the dosing of Plavix, uh, that trial, the, those trial participants were 95% white. And so when this drug was sort of released, um, it was found later that some people of uh, Pacific Islander ancestry, that that dosing actually wasn't quite right for them. Um, and so as a result, the Attorney General of Hawaii in 2014 uh, sued the drug maker for misleading marketing. And I think that this is an example, again, of um, a, a case where we can look at you know, the possibility, the potential for success in precision medicine and in, in guided dosing, pharmacogenetics. Um, but again, if this problem of inclusion persists, we're going to continue to um, we're going to continue to sort of run up against these roadblocks. They may work for um, a, a majority of the population. They may work for a significant percentage of the population. But there are still going to be parts of the population that are going to be left out that we need to consider. And part of what I want to do in, in, in presenting this, these examples is that we can see how in these cases, right, the, the issue has sort of come up after, um, uh, after the negative effects have already occurred. And what I'd like this group and all of us to think about in the workshop is how we can think about preventing these issues at the, at the forefront, right? So yes, diversity in clinical trials is an issue, um, but as we're thinking about developing these tools, how can we keep these, um, the, uh, how can we keep this idea of inclusion? How can, how can we keep this challenge of equity at the forefront, right? So again, keeping the optim, optimism, keeping the excitement for developing these tools, but sort of balancing that with, wait, okay, what are the other things that we need to consider as we're developing these, uh, these technologies? So part of, um, so these, these examples that I shared, they come from sort of um, a few years, all I think within the last five years or so. So as an anthropologist, my work, um, what I do is I look at the social and cultural impacts of health data, health technologies. And so as I was kind of finishing up my dissertation work, which was just focused on genetics and how uh, people of African ancestry were kind of interpreting genetics and how their physicians were sharing their um, genetic reports with them, I saw this, um, I saw these issues sort of um, sort of kind of emerging in this wider field of precision medicine, not just in genomics. And so what I wanted to do was start to ask questions about how do we see the potential for bias, for discrimination, for inequity as this field uh, develops. And so uh, in uh, 2017, uh, I started a one-year exploratory project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation where I interviewed leaders in precision medicine. So I talked with academic researchers who are working on precision medicine research projects. I talked with software engineers who are working with different kinds of health data, who work with uh, uh, genetic data, who work with electronic uh, medical record data, imaging data. Um, I also talked with some patient advocates, again, to try to do what um, scholar Alondra Nelson calls anticipatory social science, right? How can we begin to ask these questions before the problems become widespread, bef before this field become, becomes widespread, bef before these tools really have sort of gotten out of the gate and it's hard to, to kind of bring them back? Um, so I published the results of this study as well as a visualization of some of the um, precision medicine projects sort of nationally happening um, in the uh, government sphere, so the All of Us Research Program, as well as I did also uh, speak with and interview um, folks at uh, a regional study in New York at the NYU Human Project, if people are familiar with it. And I also did, after many months of, of um, wrangling and uh, getting people to trust me, did get to speak with um, uh, some of the staff at Google working on Project Baseline, which is their precision medicine initiative, to ask them how they are thinking about where the potential for challenges, bias, inequity, discrimination in um, precision medicine research. So um, this report is, is available on the Data and Society website openly. It's a, I will warn you, it's a longer kind of text-based report with a lot of quotes and things like that. Um, but it does surface some important issues. Um, in this report, we essentially uh, 
split our findings into two main buckets. One is uh, from our interviewees. They discussed all the, all the different ways that uh, bias can sort of enter in data input. So in addition to inclusion, uh, we also talk about sort of issues in electronic health records and spe uh, specifically uh, patients who may have kind of spotty health records, how that impacts the data. If you're thinking about building algorithms or AI models sort of on top of those records, the things you need to do. Um, there are also some really uh, interesting quotes that I'm going to be following up doing a, a deeper dive study on this later from uh, software engineers where they talk about the process in which they uh, do data curation. Um, and this is interesting because it refers to the talk earlier or the comments earlier that were made essentially saying that, you know, the bioinformatics people, the IT people, we need to have them together. Then we need to have them with the clinical team. And in some of the interviews that I did with software engineers who were, um, in this case, they were not at an academic medical center. They were sort of um, working um, in private industry, but they essentially talked me through these processes of how they collect health data and curate it. And these are people who are not clinically trained. These are computer scientists. And they walked me through sort of how they make decisions about how they label health data, what they, what they mean, what diabetes means, what you know sepsis means, right? And I asked when I sort of heard them going through this process, I said, well, do you bring in clinicians to help you interpret this data, to help you curate this data, to build these uh, models, to build these algorithms? And they said, well, you know, sometimes we do, but the two main barriers to that is that it's really expensive to have clinicians work with us to go through and generate these labels for the data. So sometimes we just don't have the budget for that. And the second kind of barrier that they talked about in this process of data curation is they said, well, and also there have been times where we have had pro projects where we've had the budget and we've had the time to bring in clinicians, but when we bring them in, they actually don't agree themselves about what the data means. So they don't really bring much clarity to us. So it's actually easier if we then make the, the decisions about what the, what the data mean. So it's really kind of, if you want to see some of those quotes, and as I said, I'm going to be doing a deeper dive onto that particular issue to, to see this other world of um, people in kind of informatics um, who are making decisions about um, what health data mean and how these models are being sort of built on, on that. And I want to just share with you uh, just a few interview ex excerpts from this uh, study that we did from the Fairness and Procession and Medicine Research Study. And I want to share um, these interview excerpts in particular because I think they're, um, they're illuminating sort of, of this process of how the multiple ways and sort of the multiple layers in which bias um, can be embedded in health, uh, in health data. So um, this quote is from an interview that I conducted with someone who is actually at um, an All of Us Research Program site. They are an investigator um, at an institution that's an All of Us Research Program site. And this particular interviewee specializes in community engagement work and, and trial uh, recruitment and inclusion. And uh, he talked me through a, an example of um, a lung cancer screening, uh, of lung cancer screening and sort of how this issue of inclusion um, creates problems down the line. So he says, well, you know, we have guidelines for our lung cancer screening, screening. This came from a study, the National Lung Screening Trial. And he said, of those 53,000 people who were in the trial, only 4% were African American. And so we have guidelines based on that 4%. And he goes on to say, um, essentially, that because you had such low minority, minority enrollment in the study, you didn't look at the smoking uh, habits of some urban communities. Um, and he, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but he says essentially, right, that in some communities, they may smoke different kinds of cigarettes, which means that they wouldn't, um, if they were asked, do you smoke 30 packs a year, they would say no, and so they wouldn't be... Um, they would meet the guidelines for inclusion for the screening. Um, but again, it sort of goes back to how the trial was, uh, one, how, uh, what the, the participants were, who the participants were, and sort of how these guidelines were later, later developed. And why this uh, quote is important is that he goes on to say, well, so we have these guidelines. Um, there was a less than nationally kind of represented, representative um, percentage of of African Americans included in the trial. And then as a result, we have people in, in the community who weren't screened. And what he says is that then in some cases, in the aggregate, uh, people present with lung cancer, let's say, at a 
at a more advanced stage. And if you have an algorithm that's learning from the data, that's learning from EHR data, right, um, it could appear that perhaps there is some physiological reason why people of African descent present with lung cancer at more advanced stages, right? Like the, the algorithm is learning sort of from these patterns. And it may be sort of embedded that actually the reason why um, the, in aggregate this community looks like this in the data is not because is not because there's a physiological difference or something else, right, that it has to do with the screening guidelines and whether they were screened in or not, and then the research that um, led to the development of those screen screening guidelines. So I think this is a really kind of um, important example to sort of show how we go from research to uh, guidelines to people coming in and being screened to then being turned into data and then that data being uh, the data that could be potentially used to train a to train a model. And I understand that one of the panelists um, was, uh, I believe, the head statistician on the National Lung Cancer Trial um, or National Lung Trial. And my aim here is not to sort of put a spotlight on this trial in particular and, you know, say that there's something wrong with it. I think it's just uh, an illum uh, uh, a particularly um, important example that illuminates how these biases can be embedded if there isn't attention to sort of the historical, cultural uh, context in which these data were collected. So I just want to finish off with some key questions. So, oh, sorry, that's so small. So one is kind of how do we balance a need to improve medical research and care with concerns for equity? Can we advance both health innovation and fairness at the same time? So this kind of gets back to what I was talking about earlier, that yes, we have, um, we have so much data. We heard so many panelists this morning talking about all of the potential that we have with all of this data, with connecting different kinds of data. And sometimes a call to sort of look at the context of the data or a call to, to stop and sort of think about, well, were, was this data inclusive or not? Or was this trial inclusive can, or not? It could seem like it's uh, sort of trying to stem the excitement and slow down um, advancement. But I do think it's important to keep those in mind because as the previous example show, if we uh, don't address those sort of at the forefront, um, it's likely that there will be negative impacts um, as the technologies develop. Um, the other, and, and so one way to respond to this question I say is just to, in addition to focusing on precision medicine as about targeting the individual as getting to that N at one, I also want us to think about how we can consider groups and the potential impacts on groups, right? So we are so used to in the precision medicine, precision oncology field, sort of focusing on how we can improve uh, care for individuals, which is, of course is a laudable goal, but individuals in our society are also part of groups, and I think it will be also valuable if we keep both frames in mind, if we keep the individual in mind, as well as the kind of group impacts and group membership. Um, the other question is, how do we move beyond percentage, percentages to provide greater context, especially when using big data and precision interventions? And I think that this is an... Um, this is an important point, of course, in all biomedical research to get to more inclusive, uh, to get to more inclusive trials, to get more participation and engagement. But I think particularly in big data and particularly when we have algorithms and, and deep learning and um, various other AI tools, it can be really easy for the context of the data to get lost. Um, and so it's really important to sort of keep that central. And when I say context, um, I also, again, with that example that I used previously, right, even if you have a, a nationally represented sort of number in your trial, there may still be contextual differences or, or embedded cultural issues in that data that you have to uh, that you have to be aware of. So again, when I uh, talked to some folks at Google about Project Baseline, they talked about you know they they were really going to do as much as they could to get their uh, to get their project baseline to have a nationally represented, nationally represented, na nationally representative um, uh, kind of uh, population. Um, however, in another one of our interviewees was very critical of that because they said, "Well, the, even if they get you know six percent or seven percent of African Americans, because of where they're doing their recruiting, they're going to get Af African Americans from the kind of San Francisco area, which may not represent." may not really be nationally representative of African Americans. And so again, right, we have to think about um, how there can be, how we can move past percentages to think about cultural context um, and how that cultural context matters, as well as the history in which, uh, the history of how these data were collected. Um, and referencing the, the comments from earlier about how 
in, in precision oncology and precision medicine, um, we really need these integrated teams. I would also argue that another potential member of the team or members of the team that we could add could be uh, social scientists, could be public health researchers who could add this kind of context to the data, especially as they're being used in these big data, um, big data uh, technologies. So again, just want to kind of close on that. I want to just emphasize that if we think of the ripple effects uh, and start to think about these questions sort of before these uh, technologies become widespread, I think we can get to a future for precision medicine and uh, precision oncology that is equitable and um, leads to improvement for all of us. So thank you.